Uh, you have, I'm sure, received uh, other communications from me about Voss's research and his accomplishments there. Uh, today, his talk is going to be on a very unique thing that he has done in teaching international business, and, that's in his, uh, and that has to do with student collaboration projects, and there's an international global one that he runs, as a way to enhance learning, research, and networking. So Vas will share his experiences with the X Culture project that involves a collaboration of over 1,500 students from 30 countries in a given semester. As a part of the course, in teams of four, four to seven, the students from different countries work together for about two months, experience challenges, and learn best practices of international virtual collaboration. The presentation will focus on challenges and best practices of recruiting participants and coordinating their efforts. Collaboration exercises as a research platform, challenges and best practices for data collection, analysis, and paper co-development, the effects of international collaboration projects on learning, students' feedback, and teaching evaluations, powerful and free virtual collaboration tools for data collection, co-author, and team member coordination, performance tracking, and paper co-development, and collaboration exercises as a professional, interpersonal, and interinstitutional networking platform. Thank you, Vas. That was a pretty long list, and I'm sure you'll get there. Yes, and I okay. probably should start with apologies. First of all, I was a little late. For some reason, I thought it was a three. Second, as you know, even though the project is supposed to be about high-tech stuff, in fact, many things that I will be discussing today haven't been even available for more than half a year. And at the same time, as you can see, technology doesn't work. So I'm yes. not sure if it's <laughs> a good sign. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, today I want to talk a little bit about a project that I've been running for a couple of uh, years now. And uh, even though this one was specifically designed for an international management course, something's telling me you can successfully or equally successfully use the same approach in just about any course. We're going to start with a very simple question, and it was supposed to be displayed on the screen, but I suppose it doesn't matter. What are the goals of a faculty member? What do faculty members want? Well, I suppose all of us want different things, and I don't know, I have pictures of some, of some of the faculty members here, but whatever we want, I guess there is only one way to get there, or different goals, but one way. And that would be good research, right? Good teaching, and good what? Good service. Services, right? And I think I might have invented the best way to cover all three. Um, I have to give you a warning, and again, uh, all three, but first a little bit about the project. So um, as was said in the presentation of this presentation, uh, what I'm talking about here is a project uh, in which uh, students from about 30 countries work together for a semester. It's a little bit shorter than, uh, shorter than a real semester because in some countries the semester starts later and some earlier. So we get about two months of when students work together. And uh, during that time, students learn something, and I'll tell you later on what they learn. I get a chance to collect some data. Um, I meet people from all around the world, and I'd like to think that I do something valuable for the academic community. And so let me talk a little bit first about, uh, well, I guess, Warren, even though it sounds like a magic tool, it's not a magic pill. There will be lots of lots of what I call butt time, time when you spend on your butt working. Um, <laughs> in fact, if I may tell you, I thought about that just 10 minutes ago. Uh, when I was um, a kid, teenager, I was doing martial arts. I remember one time we were sitting at a competition, and one of my friends said something like this. He says, human body is so perfect. I mean, there is no way we can further improve it. And I say something like, you know what? If I had a tail, that would help. <laughs> now I think I was wrong. Actually, I wish I had a stronger brain. Mm -hmm. But this stuff, when you have so many people involved uh, and so much data being collected, I really wish I had a few extra gigabytes of RAM in my brain, because sometimes it's just literally like I feel the pain here of trying to comprehend everything. Many of you make fun of me because I have four screens connected to my computer. Well, it's a necessity when you have so much stuff going on. Flipping between documents in one screen is just impossible. So anyway, it's definitely a possibility with something like this, with a project like this, but it will require lots of work. But the good thing is it's a predictable success. As long as you do it, you will definitely get there. You will have all those three. Uh, unlike, for example, a regular research where you can be working for years and you don't like a lottery, you don't know if it's going to reach an outcome or not. I think I should talk about history. And there are actually some people here related, related to that history. So how where the idea came from? It's not because I'm so smart, it's just a lucky coincidence. I guess. When I joined this school, um, at that time, um, 
Economics 300 was a prerequisite for management 301. And turns out there was some overlap in the two courses. So there were some things that students were taking or um, uh, that we were covering in those two courses, Jeff and I. And so one of the things that we decided to do is to review what content we have in our courses, see where the overlap is, and see if we can eliminate the overlap. And so I couldn't think of anything better than just to order all possible international business type books and just basically see what's normally covered in an international business book. I ordered, I'd say, about 20 of them. Pretty much every single textbook on IV I could find. And as I was going through those books, I found one very interesting thing. Anyone knows what that thing is? I was very surprised. The only time when I... You all begin no, with one step. The, the amazing thing was that they were all identical. It's like statistics books. I mean, exactly the same list of chapters. Sometimes they would change chapter two and chapter, chapter three, but it's exactly the same content. And at that time, I thought, well, if everyone teaches the same content, maybe I can find a professor in a different country and team up my students with the students of that professor, and they will basically you know, learn international business or management uh, in practice. And so um, that was the idea. Um, yes, that's basically how my idea came along. I couldn't think of anything better than to send out a call to you know, maybe recruit some partners uh, through the Academy of Management, the Academy of International Business List Service. Uh, and that's the first challenge. How do you find those partners? Well, luckily for us, we have these professional associations. And again, luckily for me, I got about 50 responses in the first hour uh, from all around the world. Some people would just say, thank you, that's a great idea. Others would say, I want to participate. Um, not all who signed up participated eventually. Uh, there were some last minute dropouts, uh, but we had, um, and I have a map here, seven countries in the first semester. So I'm not sure if you taking questions as you go. Uh, you can ask the question. I'll sure. stop you right yes. here. What was your goal when you sent out that email or broadcasting to all these folks? What was your request? What was your exact request? Well, this is an excellent question because when I was doing it two years ago, or when I'm going through my documents and correspondence, I was so not dumb, inexperienced at that time. For example, in terms of my goal, the only goal was to give students an interesting project to work on, academic. I never thought that it would be to good research or good academic circles. In terms of what I was asking for, I just basically said I have this idea. So if anyone teaches international business, do you want to team up your students with my students and have them do it? Do on a common project. Yes. Now I do it completely course. different. And now I advertise the research part first. And then I say, by the way, your students will actually give you very good evaluations. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, and then, so now, I mean, first, like, the whole idea to collect data came in the second semester when somebody emailed me and said, I'm finishing up my doctoral dissertation, can I use your students to collect my data? And then I thought, oh, sure. I mean, I don't know about your students, but I have lots of ideas of my own. Why not? And so I applied for the IRB approval. Surprisingly, it was easy to get because it's part of the course. And so, yeah, but anyway, the first semester we had seven countries, and I have, if you can see the dots here, then um, in the next semester Is it we- India or Pakistan? We had right? Pakistan in the first one. We okay. have four universities from India. Specific. We have four universities from India this semester. So that's the second semester added countries, then uh, again, and uh, again. So as of now, this semester, this very semester, we have 31 countries, 47 universities, about almost 2,000 students. That's the largest we've ever had. We'll see how it goes. And on the one hand, I'm kind of happy about it. On the other hand, I almost regret that I let so many people in. It's just a nightmare to manage it. That's definitely very challenging. The worst part, and I will be talking about it later, is that you can't really outsource it to students very much. Mm -hmm. um, most of the things require decision making, so it's not like some data margin, yes, some maybe, I don't know, but emails, including correspondence with students occasionally and all the different instructors, most of those requires that I make decisions, and so I cannot really hire a secretary or a person on my money to do that. Yeah. Another problem is that there are only so many, there are some things that students can do for you. Like, for example, as I said, you get massive data sets with thousands of observations measured at multiple points in time. So you have all those cell files that it takes like five minutes just to open. Uh, but there are only two people that I know except for me who can make do that kind of work. Uh, there is one guy there. He never did it, but I know he's capable of it. And then there is this guy, Donald Pound, uh, one of your uh, GAs, who for some reason was assigned only for four or time to this semester, so uh, I can get to one of the four hours. And the other students, and I've had many. Donald, who? Donald, 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 Donald. MSA student. MSA. And okay. he expressed interest to move into accounting, his major as a GA next semester, so I'm going to lose him, uh, even though he's uh, been apparently enjoying it. Uh, all the other students, graduate students that I've had, work with both directly as my GAs as well as hired 
completely useless. I mean, they can just go get it. First of all, I'm surprised how a student can be getting an MBA in, for example, accounting and not know what vertical lookup is. Uh, how many of you don't know what vertical lookup is? Shame on you. In Microsoft Excel? Yes, but many oh students God. don't. And then you have no, no, I don't know it myself. Oh, all right. So, all right. <laughs> No, but what I mean is that some yeah. of those things require a little bit more yes. knowledge than just how to enter data. And uh, as I said, I've had only one student who was capable of doing it. In fact, he was better than I at that stuff. He would keep talking some things. But um, anyway, so that's... What is that country in the middle of the Pacific? American Samoa? Hawaii. No, that's Hawaii. We have a uh, university. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. And then we have New Zealand and yeah, Japan. Yeah. So we have all continents represented, island nations. On so just Ghana. Island. Is that Ghana in Africa? Yes. Okay. So uh, they have about 150 MBA students every semester. They've been participating for, I believe, a year and a half. So here it's a combination of MBA students and undergraduates. Excellent question. We have uh, almost half of them are MBA students. Uh, this semester we tried to keep MBAs with MBAs, undergrads with undergraduate students. Again, I'll have a separate slide on that, but I want to say a separate uh, kind of comment here. One of the big challenges is that uh, most of the applications come from the United States. If you teach economics or maybe marketing or whatever else you teach engineering, uh, for you it probably wouldn't matter. So the composition of the team, in fact, you would probably be happy with all school to be from the United States. For me, because part of the project or one of the main reasons of the project is that students get international experience or cross-cultural experience. We want the teams to be as culturally diverse as possible. And so I have to turn down about a dozen maybe more applications from US-based schools every semester. Uh, just because we would have too many American students and basically half of each team will be American. Uh, another problem is that even with those rejections, we still get quite a few American students and all American universities this semester have undergraduate students only who are supposed to participate. And so we had to put, we have a number of only MBA teams, but they would have one American undergraduate student on that team, um, kind of to make it a little bit more culturally balanced. Uh, so, um, and this is part of an assignment. Yes, it's a okay. course. Yes, that's an excellent part, uh, question. It's a part of a course. Uh, so, and in fact, I guess that's my next slide. So, I'll, I'll have a whole. Yeah. By the way, these are the countries of studies. Uh, we have 69 countries this semester by country of origin. So, because as you can imagine, many students are not from the country where they study. So, we have a truly global um, team. And uh, yeah, I had some pictures of our students here, but obviously you couldn't see them from all around the world. So. Um, um, well, I talked about challenges uh, of finding partners, and as I said, I was using the um, Academy of Management, Academy of International Business, list terms. The challenge there is that um, only, well, even though membership in those organizations is huge, but there is virtually no one, for example, for former Soviet Union. And so this is the very first semester I was able to recruit two schools from Ukraine, but only because I knew the professors. And so uh, that's how I found them. They just never come into those conferences. There may be, like, for example, African universities, where we have Ghana, the professor just happens to be a member of the academy of management, but then again, I'm sure there are more who would have participated, and they just probably don't know about the project. So that's one challenge. Another so one. Nothing from the American University in Cairo. Nothing from the bigger universities of South Africa. You no, know, we have um, three universities from United Arab Emirates this semester, which is not quite Africa, yeah. right? So, uh, and yeah, nothing else from South huh. Africa. We had, and I didn't have a slide for that, but maybe I should mention, in the second semester, we had a, uh, I received an email from a student who says, I'm studying in Africa. I'm not sure what country, but I'm not sure what country, and he says, well, my professor wouldn't participate, but I would like to participate myself. And I say, well, sure, yeah, I'm happy for the African students, so I basically put him on the mailing list. The semester, but I started the whole thing like three months before the semester starts, so we get everything arranged. So there are about 20 professors on the uh, list, and so we communicate, exchange ideas, and stuff like that. And then one day I received, he gave me two email addresses, and one day I get an error message for both of them. And I don't know what to do, and then one professor also emails to everyone, and what is it, the same thing, the Charles Watt book, you know, and just kind of big enough to from New York. Anyway, he, unlike me, is more experienced, and so he starts researching what's going on. And so he goes and searches for that email address. Turns out the guy from Africa is an old scammer. And so, uh, his email accounts, Yahoo and Gmail, I believe, were blocked. And so I want to be nice, I don't want to say anything bad to him, but I emailed him, event, eventually he emails me and says, my email account, something happened, here's another third address. And I start asking him, so what school exactly are you at and stuff? It turns out, yeah, the guy has nothing to do. And I don't know how he found out about the project, but the good news is it was before I sent out the list of 4,000 something students to all instructors for emails. So the damage was basically none at that time, but could have been much worse. 
Yeah, in fact, that was one of my first questions uh, I wanted to ask. When you said you allowed one individual student, um, how do you know the credentials of the student yeah. as opposed to the class? If it's a professor, yeah. it's much more. Well, I naturally assume that it's a graduate student as he introduced himself, who is a member of the Academy of Management and he's on the reserve, so I thought I mean, the only way he would have known is that you know. Yeah, but again, at that time, didn't even occur to me. Now I know. In mm -hmm. fact, when uh, Professor. Uh, a Kamea from Africa contacted me and asked I would like to participate. My first reaction was, is that another guy or it's a real guy? <laughs> and then I noticed that he says I'm from Ghana. I go to Mom's Aqua and ask him, uh, you know, what he thinks. And he says, what's the name? I say, I'm from Ghana. Oh, psh, I know the guy. I mean, he's my friend. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so. And he's a spammer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Another problem is that, as I said, many professors sign up but then drop out the last minute. Uh, so uh, obviously the difference in schedules is an issue. Our semester starts at a different time. So this semester, for example, for the first time, we had a two-track kind of arrangement. So we had early track and late track. Early track just finished, and uh, late track started about um, uh, five days ago. And so uh, some countries, especially Commonwealth countries like the UK, Ireland, uh, India, there the semester starts earlier and ends earlier, and in many schools actually they have short semesters. Mm -hmm. So we had a bunch of those countries participating from January until March, and then the rest starts from March and we go to May, so this semester. So those kind of issues. But again, it's, it's uh, manageable, um, and uh, I guess the only other challenge I had was that in some countries, professors are much more dependent on depend much more on their administration. And I had to write support letters to the professors that they presented to their deans, so that the deans give them the permission to participate in the project. But now I have a matrix letter, so they have a kind of request come from somewhere in Indonesia, no problem, there is whatever, so, so that kind of works well. Um, in terms of the task, again, uh, for me the challenge was uh, how do you design the task so that it's uh, first beneficial to the students, enjoyable to the students, fits well with the course uh, requirements, and at the same time, as I said, can be still used for a uh, research purpose. And so again, uh, I'm sure you can use a different task if you teach a different course. What I decided to do is um, our students are writing a, a business proposal for an existing uh, international company, and we give them a list of, uh, from Walmart to Toyota, so there are a number of worldwide known companies, and they basically have to come up with the next big idea for the company and write up a business plan. And so the business plan following the chapters of the standard international business book. So where would you build your factory or uh, provide a, a service from? Um, uh, where would you hire people, locals, expatriates, third country nationals? If you need more money, how would you obtain financing? Uh, what would be the challenges of payments? Uh, would you go with a green, green field or buy an existing company? Uh, how would you incorporate it in the larger company? So basically all those kind of questions. And so there are about 10 or 12 questions that they have to answer. Um, the questions require some special knowledge, but the good thing is that even a student who is not really a guru in international business and economics still can say something to just about any of those questions. So even though some students are less prepared, they still may have some ideas and they still can provide some interesting feedback. And so that serves well, very well because again, my students, I would say, are more prepared just because I designed the project and I designed it specifically to fit my course. For some professors, it may not be such a perfect fit, so some of the questions if there were two technical students, may not be fully prepared. One thing I should emphasize, though, is that at least in my course, and it may not be the case for other courses, but to my students, I emphasize that this is an exercise, it's not a test, meaning that I'm more lenient about the quality of their answers, and I'm more interested in the process and the experience. So I say that as long as you, as a team, provide a report that answers every question, and it makes some sense, your questions make some sense, and you all agree on that, I'm happy. So for me, you've gained the experience to work for a semester with others. And I'm not that concerned about the exact quality of the project. You have tank on the side, but you have exams. That's one that has to know. But here it's about experience. Uh, so try to gain that experience. And so that makes, kind of alleviates uh, stress. Students become much more uh, relaxed and enjoy the process much more. Because in the first semester, we were um, uh, evaluating them on a series of tasks. And every time it was from one to one kind of scale. And so sometimes some students were not fully prepared, some didn't speak English, some were just, you know, not diligent enough. And as you can imagine, then the rest of the team gets, you know, upset because they feel that they are underpowered or, you know, they have this balance. Yes. What are the two kinds of wine students have in a different country? Yes, normally it's seven students, seven countries, uh, though again, occasionally we would have two American students. And this is actually a very good question, I'm not sure if you kind of wanted to answer me so deeply, but again, since my purpose is, um, uh, one of the purposes of the project is research, and one of the research questions we're trying to answer is how 
team diversity affects team performance and dynamics. And by diversity, I mean anything from number of countries represented to geographic distance between the uh, team members to cultural difference, to economic difference, all those kinds of things. The problem is that if every team is seven students, seven countries, you don't really have a control group where everything is homogeneous. And so this semester, for the first time, we actually have a number of teams that are one country, uh, one nation teams. And we have a few American teams where it's virtual teams, different cities, but all Americans. And we have also, luckily, a few teams, uh, Italy, Spain, Taiwan, if I remember correctly, Hong Kong, where part of the class was fluent enough in, in English to participate in international teams. But then there were some students who wanted to participate but didn't speak English enough, and so they would be doing exactly the same task, but they will be working only with students from that same class. So we'll have some monocultural teams, as well as we'll have some traditional non-cultural teams. And so one of the goals is to see if the way they communicate, the way they perform is different, depending on all those things. But yes, generally in seven countries, seven students. Um, so, so and they basically just write the business plan. Again, I have a separate slide on that, but maybe I should talk about that now. Um, one of the big kind of dreams is that uh, one day the students will not only write those proposals and get their grades, but uh, since we have real existing companies, the hope is that one day those companies will express interest working with us. And in the ideal world, I would want to first uh, members of the best teams to be flown to the campus of the company, meet the management, maybe the CEO, present their idea, and maybe even see their idea implemented in the real world. I've had a number of meetings with um, the um, GF uh, and the express general interest, but eventually they're not sure if they have land power to review the proposals, because we have like, 200 teams at a time, 250 actually this semester. Uh, so, but hopefully that's one thing. So for the companies, that would be a huge benefit because um, Half of these MBA students and half of those are senior undergraduate students. So a year from now, they will graduate, and you will have to pay lots of money for them to share your, their ideas with you. And now they are basically working for you for free. So and who knows? Maybe one of them will come up with a big thing. For the students, the big advantage is obviously they, they work kind of for a real company. Uh, they feel like they now have real practical experience, not just work with other students. So uh, we'll see if it's going to work or not, but that's kind of the ultimate goal. And so we now have, in the very first semester, we used a hypothetical joint venture. Now we have the real companies. And again, the plan is to send those proposals to the companies and hope that they may, maybe will participate. And then maybe give some money to the students to you know, maybe win teams. And maybe, just maybe, some of the students will be hired. Because for the company, it's like a semester long interview. We, we get all the data on student performance from diligence to quality to creativity. And uh, so I guess, you know, what else do you want to wish for? So what exactly, what exactly is the instruction that's given to the students? Do you, I'm imagining that you get all of this data from the perspective of the instructors email you and the list of the students that are yes. in your class. And do you create the groups? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, so you create the groups. Mm -hmm. So then you, you create the assignment in terms of instructions what exactly it is that the group is supposed to do. Yes. So what what do you tell them to do? What well, the instructions, instructions? The, there are two sets of instructions. One is a short one, three-page document, which basically says, imagine that you're a consultant team to a company. This is the list of companies, choose one that you like. You have to come up with a business proposal for that company and write a business plan. These are the answers for uh, topics that you need to discuss in your business plan. Then this is the format requirements for the proposal. This is how you submit the proposal. We just turn it in. Uh, for a university in Australia, it allows us to put everything basically a digital Dropbox of Blackboard. So the Blackboard would allow me to accept uh, submissions from other uh, universities. So basically that's what you need to do. But then there is another document that we call ex culture training document. This one is about 40 pages long, and so this one has uh, screenshots for, you know, this is how you use, uh, for example, Google Docs, this is how you use Google Plus, this is how you use Skype, all that kind of stuff. For each of those tools and for each of those ideas, uh, we have a link to a video that students can watch for three, four minutes online and kind of see how it's done. Common challenges that we've experienced over these years, best practices for dealing with those experiences, like one of your teammates is not answering. It's uh, Sunday, the deadline is Monday, and half of your team disappears. What, what's going on? Well, half of your team is probably in Israel, as well as last semester. Turns out that sa Saturday there almost was a big kind of holiday there, and so like half of, well not half of the team, but we had a huge class from there, and so there was the Sabbath, team. man. Yes, yeah. well, we didn't even know. turn on the computer. Sunday <laughs> nights, like several day, uh, hours before deadline, uh, all of a sudden I get like 50 emails, not only from my students, but from all around the world, and they say, my Israeli teammates disappeared. What do you do, what do you do? We have only a few hours before deadline. Like, I don't know. I sent the email <laughs> to the instructor, and he says, oh yeah, that's, you know, that's not only Sabbath, it's a special Sabbath. And so yeah, they will be online in a few hours once the sun rises. 
So, but you know, those kinds of things. And so we kind of discuss those challenges there so that they know how to use them. Plus, as I said, we give instructions to how to use those tools. Uh, many of them, uh, in the first semester, students would stick with email. Email, that's like five years ago. I mean, today we have Google Plus, Google Docs, uh, Dropbox. And surprisingly, again, many people don't even know how to use those tools, but they are so valuable when we have to co-edit a document together. And so that's, again, another opportunity for the students to learn how, how to do things. In fact, Google Plus hasn't even been available like half a year ago, so it's from last summer. Yes, anyway. Uh, I don't know whether you're getting into this. Uh, how are these students putting themselves into teams? Do well, you do that, or do yes, that's, you get involved? Actually, I should get back to that, yes. Uh, I do it myself, um, arbitrary. Uh, I tried in the first semester to solicit you know, preferences. I mean, when you have uh, people so, in so I just basically open all the names on the file and in Excel and just mix and match. And then I use mail merge uh, in Excel, I mean in, in Microsoft Word, and send emails to every student with the names of his uh, or her team members. One of the things we are very, care very careful about is not to send all emails to all students because we don't want to share that much private information. So each student receives only names and emails of his or her teammates. And so this way they all know who they work with, but I don't have to share all the information. And you do all the sorting and yes, cutting and pasting to make sure that... Well, I mean, putting them on teams is not a huge challenge uh, in terms of, you know, how to combine them. I would just sort them by country and then basically match the columns together. That part takes only a few hours. The big challenges with managing that stuff is that uh, first, and this time, finally, I kind of figured out a way to do it better. But no matter how much you try, there will be only some emails that will not work. So students give emails to the instructors, but those emails sometimes are just wrong, and sometimes the account is full and is not accepting uh, emails. This time, I was very, very strict with the instructors. They had to test each email before they send those emails to me. And so it seems like we have a few, but it almost looks like it's not a problem we do not address. It's just something happened to the account in the meantime. So that's one challenge. Another challenge is that uh, students sometimes would um, uh, ch not change their name. The way the instructor gave me the name is different from what the student uses. And then sometimes I would receive an email from a student saying that I got an email from someone I don't know what they do. And then I check and it turns out the guy's name is whatever his, let's say, Chinese name is, but he introduced himself with an English name. And then there was some confusion there. So there would be issues like that. Uh, one thing I also do is uh, there are always dropouts. Some students drop the course in the middle of the semester, and occasionally there are late enrollments. And so creating the initial teams is not a huge deal, but sorting those changes uh, in the first few weeks uh, takes some time. And so to make sure that everyone's informed, I send updates to all affected parties. But then I also have a version of each of those files online. And so instructors can always look up the latest compositions in case they have you know, a student approaching them, so they see all these. And I have a student version that doesn't contain emails, and then I have an instructor version that is with emails and some other, like for example, universal information, instructor information, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Anyway, another challenge sometimes is recruiting students. In my class, it's a mandatory project students have to participate. In some classes, uh, instructors would allow them to opt out. Uh, they can write something else instead, and uh, I kind of encourage that because uh, the biggest problem we have is what I call this in students. Um, many students, I mean, come on, you all have that, right? Some students never come to lecture, or some students occasionally don't come to lectures and stuff, and that's exactly the same thing. Out of 100 students, you can expect at least two to be not committed enough. And so I almost wish that every student who was not going to participate opted out in the very beginning and did something else. And so this time, to deal with that problem, um, first we created an um, online uh, training that I just talked about, but then also there is training test. Students must take the test in order to be placed on teams. Again, I'm not really that concerned about the quality of the answers. I'm concerned about the student knowing what's going on and knowing how to access online. In the first semester, I would have emails from students receiving emails saying something like, I would send them you know, team assignments, welcome letter, and there was something like, what, the, what was going on? What was that stuff? Who are you doing? What do you want from me? And like, didn't you talk to your instructor? Didn't you talk about that in class? And then eventually, they all figure out the first. So this time, anyway, we have the screening process. And so, like, for example, this semester, even though the project started a week ago, we still have about 100 students out of uh, 1,600 or so who haven't been placed on teams because they haven't completed the training. Because I don't want one bad student to spoil experience for the other six in case the student is not participating um, uh, enough. Uh, one of them, by the way, is my student. I've uh, contacted the student many times to take the test. He comes to class, but he's not participating. So he didn't take the test. So they, by, by the way, send a few emails, but he's not replying. So I don't know. So even my students aren't coming. 
Um, finally, in some schools, uh, the students will be participating in the project not as a part of the project, but basically as an extra assignment. Uh, for example, while well, in Ukraine that was the case, I contacted the professor and said, oh, that's a wonderful project, so let's participate. But first, our semester is different because they have Euro 2012 there, and so the semester was starting earlier, ending earlier. But then also because uh, normally they wouldn't have enough, well, a good enough class in terms of the kid, but also not all students would speak English. So what they did, they just basically put posters all around campus asking if anyone would like to participate, and we've done it in many countries, and uh, so many students would volunteer and just participate basically for fun. Those tend to be, by the way, the most committed ones, unlike the ones who have to participate. Those guys, as long as they come, they're usually extremely motivated, very reliable, very diligent, and so it works very well for them as well. And then occasionally they would also get some extra credit, extra bonus, sometimes it's just for fun. But I'd say out of 30 countries, uh, 47 universities, maybe three, four schools in a given semester. So all of the others are in real classes. Um, course evaluation management. Again, it's very important that the students um, feel that the project first is beneficial to them. Second, it has to be enjoyable. And so again, luckily for me, I teach international business. So it's, it's so relevant. On the, it doesn't get any code. But again, I suppose this can be used in a class of physics and idea exchanges still valuable. Mm -hmm. Students still like to be, in fact, very interesting. I got an email yesterday from a student, uh, Scott. Uh, actually, his real name is Robert Gower, but for some reason he's called by Scott. I don't know. He asked for a reference letter. And so he took my classes being, I don't even know how long, it must have been one of the very first seasons. And he said, by the way, I'm still in contact with my students. I'm going to China soon to meet one of my friends. So apparently some of them actually develop fairly close relationships. I haven't heard about any marriages or anything like that yet. <laughs> but uh, again, apparently for them that's kind of fun. And so they talk on Skype and then Facebook Plus and then other Google Plus. Maybe that was the reason that guy was spamming. He was looking for a maid. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So, but as long as you emphasize all those benefits, plus again, uh, one thing that we do, and I have a picture here again from the wooden seat. Uh, we decided to do it in the second semester after one of the instructors asked if I could write a reference letter to you basically saying that he participated. And then I thought, well, I can actually have certificates for all instructors and for all students. Why not? Business administration pays for that, and so we have professional looking achievement certificates mailed to students, not directly to students, the instructors who then distribute the certificates. And so we have, as you can see, hopefully, logos of all schools, list of the countries, and it's you know, basically documented proof that the student has. Um, uh, experience in international collaboration. And so for students, that's kind of a big deal because they, you know, holding everything else cost them. This may be, you know, the reason why they get the job and somebody else doesn't get the job. For American students, I'm not as, at least for my students, it's, you know, nice and they, you know, smile and that's fine. But for students from developing countries, that's a big deal. We got, uh, for example, the University in Kosovo and the University in Spain last semester. They had such a big deal, like the award ceremony. They had the president of the university, they had the media, they had like everything. They invited they, you there? <laughs> unfortunately not <laughs> me, but they had the picture. So they had like a big, you know, like conference room and, you know, like a big deal. Students would come and the president of the university would shake their hands and those team, they actually sent me the links to the TV. Uh, they had like a news report, like a whole big deal. So for them, that's a big, big thing. So, uh, and uh, point structures as well for many of them matters. So, um, so I guess for the students, if you do it, students kind of appreciate that you do something. Yes? Do you find that in the groups that sometimes the students from these developing countries don't bring quite the same experiences to the group? And then, I mean, I can imagine just with different, within different universities, students are going to be like, well, this person is way more prepared and this person isn't making it such a priority. I can imagine that is multiplied when they look at Exactly. Well, we have all kinds of issues there from different, uh, in terms of preparing to the, in terms of material, but then technical skills, some know how to use all those tools, or email, Dropbox, others don't, then language proficiency, all those issues. But that's kind of the beauty of the project. The way I try to sell it to my students is, it's going to be exactly the same thing when you work and tomorrow you know, in a real job. I mean, if you work with people, by it. well, well, I'm always frustrated with joy, but we still need to be together. Well, that's back to not making a grade is dependent, I think, on well, if this is really, their grade was really highly dependent, they'd be a lot more frustrated. Yeah, well, as I said, I tried to emphasize that it's an exercise. And so now we have a series of pass-fails. They have six or seven deadlines that they have to meet. Like, by this date, your team has to decide on the, on the comp company. By this date, your team has to decide on the project. By this date, your team has to, you know, do this and this. As long as you do, it's a pass. So it's a collection of passes and fails. Uh, I even say things like, like this to my students. This may be your first and maybe last time when you have a chance to truly experiment. 
if at the end of the project you end up having elements somewhere in Saudi Arabia, I don't care as long as your team submits the proposal. So if you want to try something new or if you want to try to you know, talk this way or that way and eventually upset your teammates, it's fine. It's your chance to experiment. And so uh, frustrated, yes, especially in the middle of the project, like, like two weeks, three weeks, into, well, a month into the project. Many students would be very frustrated. I mean, you know, somebody's never responded. Like, like some students, one is for some reason, just doesn't care or got sick or something like that. Some students would be frustrated because they cannot reach an agreement. And so I would, for example, get sometimes uh, comments that, you know, this student in whatever country is so stubborn, you know, anything I propose, he turns down, and so we cannot reach a consensus. I'm not frustrated no problem. with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, well, so are I, they going to you or they No, well, I, I try to emphasize that students should contact only their instructors. I mean, and do they? last semester, by the way, I was requesting that every time there is an email related to the project, they put X culture somewhere so I can identify those emails and delete them. There were about 8,000 emails that I had to delete. Oh not all God. of them, not all of them, I must admit, were, you know, I typed them. Some of them were a mess, you know, like, for example, this is your team, so it would be right, you know, a thousand right there. But it's, it's a lot, it's like dozens and dozens every day. Uh, but what I'm trying to say here is that first, in the course evaluations, and in the emails that I received, I don't know, like at the end of the project, I sent personally to each student, uh, thank you for participating. And I'd say three, four hundred of them replied and say, you know, thank you. Toward the end of the project, they actually appreciate it very much. And so, difference is yes. Frustrating, yes. But that's the whole value. I mean, it's not going to be different. And uh, this is the whole point. I mean, if I put you with a guy from you know, your classroom, it would not be educational. Here, try to figure out how to deal with that guy if he doesn't speak language. Uh, now, Google Translate works so well. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, I shouldn't probably be talking about Google Translate. But anyway, some students admitted that they would be communicating in English exclusively through Google Translate. I last summer taught a course in Colombia, and so they couldn't pay me, and there was something with the bank. And I had to communicate with the bank in Spanish. I don't speak a word in Spanish, but I was using Google Translate. It almost looked like they never realized that I don't speak Spanish. They sent me the letter, I translated, I translated back. I eventually got my mind, so it works. So exactly the same thing. So um, basically the same idea. Um, now talking about research, and I'll probably do this one, and then I'll stop. Um, so. There are different ways to do it, and I'll briefly talk about how we do it, but again, you can arrange it differently for your course. First, in terms of what kind of data you can have. What we do is, uh, we do a bunch of online surveys. Uh, so we have the uh, training test, then we have pre-project survey where we test all kinds of things. Uh, then we have two surveys during the project, then we have post-project survey. So we can